Uh, my name is Bernard Hochman. I'm a professor at the European University Institute at the Robert Schumann Center. So just very quickly, I'm not going to go through people's bios. There, there are detailed bios in the program, uh, in the conference program. We have uh, Mr. Carol de Fuch, who is the European Trade Commissioner. We have Mr. Mario Monti, who has been the Commissioner for Competition and for the Internal Market, and of course was recently the Prime Minister of Italy. We have Sylvie Kaufmann here, who is the editorial leader of the, the newspaper Le Monde, and we have Anna uh, uh, Trianda Lufliu, who, and I, my Greek is really bad, as you can see, who is a colleague of mine here at the European University Institute. So the way we're going to organize the panel is Mr. De Gucht and Mr. Monti will give some opening remarks, after which we will have a discussion um, on some of the things to bring forward, and I want to keep at least half an hour for questions from the floor so that we can have a debate and an engagement uh, with the panel. So let me just go from left to right and start with Mr. De Gucht. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think you have asked me that I would say something, no? Okay. Um, one of the questions that uh, we were asked to answer is uh, whether uh, uh, the European Commission and the European Union did the right thing when we uh, got confronted with this crisis uh, starting in 2008 and uh, more precisely since 2010. I think that uh, um, the clue is in the question because uh, we were facing uh, imminent uh, disaster. The fact that we can now discuss this here, uh, whether we did it right, completely right, what did we wrong, means that uh, uh, we have uh, been in a position to to solve the question. If not, uh, this discussion certainly would not take uh, uh, place in this uh, shape anymore. Now, to give an answer to that question, trying to give a fair answer to the question, uh, I think we have to acknowledge that uh, when we were confronted with this crisis that the European Union and also the European Commission uh, had a very empty toolkit we didn't have the tools to remedy this crisis. Uh, we had a uh, European Central Bank that was not supposed to actively intervene. We had a European Union without money, without a budget to uh, confront the uh, uh, financial crisis. And we had a decision-taking mechanism that uh, was largely, in fact, uh, uh, not respected uh, since uh, some years before, France and, and, and Germany did not respect their um, budgetary obligations. So that's where we had to start from. To a certain extent, we had to start from scratch. And uh, I see uh, this crisis as, as a, a good example, a good or a bad example, if you wish, uh, of the fact that the European Union, when they are really with their back against the wall, manages to take action. Then they do. And I think we have largely taken the right decisions. Uh, the discussion about austerity and, and growth came afterwards, but uh, in the heat of the crisis there were no other solutions, I believe, than the one that we have been taking. Uh, but the, the, the big problem with Europe is that once this sense of urgency is over, you know, you revert to the old habits. Uh, you will see in the coming years that, again, uh, the fact that the European Commission uh, has to scrutinize national budgets and uh, uh, should give uh, directives on what should happen, uh, impose sanctions if uh, uh, rules are not respected, that this again will be put into question. So once the sense of urgency is over, it, begin, it uh, uh, again becomes a question of legitimacy, you know, whereby the member states claim, and not member states, not only the, uh, the presidents of the prime ministers, but also the parliaments claim that they are the ones that have legitimacy in Europe and not the European institutions. Now, this is not right. And it's not right, I believe, in, in, in both directions. I truly believe that the legitimacy of Europe has two pillars. It has, on the one hand, the direct election of a European Parliament. That's the legitimacy uh, based on the citizen. And the European Parliament has uh, grown tremendously over the last years, over the last 30 years, but certainly over the last 10 years. But there is a second source of legitimacy, and those are the member states. 
that uh, are reflected in the Council of Ministers, largely deciding by majority. And I think that, uh, let's say, the European approach should respect the member states, but the member states should also respect the direct European legitimacy in the division of labor, in the division of uh, competences. And you, we even see that, uh, and I will, I will stop with that, we even see that, uh, for example, in trade policy. Trade policy is an exclusive competence of the European Union, not of the European Commission, but of the European Union. It is. But nevertheless, you see that uh, all the time member states try to claw back, you know. Uh, for example, they will always try to have uh, mixed, uh, mixed treaties so that not only the European Parliament, what's in the Treaty of Lisbon, but also the national parliaments have to ratify the trade agreements. So there is a constant, yeah, let's call it a battle between those two sources of legitimacy and uh, there should be much more mutual respect between those two sources of legitimacy. If not, I believe it will remain very, very difficult. Uh, well, just to move to the, uh, to the stage where whenever there is a problem, it's not any longer a discussion on whether or not European should exist, but that it becomes a political problem. Uh, with differences of opinion. No? If there is a problem in France, okay, the discussion is not whether France should, ex should exist or should not exist. No, it's about whether the, the, the political solutions are right. And that, of course, that kind of, of, of problems you have to, to solve uh, by elections. Thank you. Mr. Monti. I presume you asked me the same thing that you asked the Commissioner de Gucht, and I presume that he answered to your question. This is a good demonstration of how Europe, even if it spoke one language, may have other problems in uh, speaking with one solid voice. Um, the crisis, uh, what did we, did we, did uh, Europe do wrong, uh, what uh, right, what next? I would say that uh, the crisis for the European portion of the crisis came out of a partial mismanagement of a rather sound policy framework. Uh, I believe that the policy framework on which the uh, Eurozone is built is, uh, is pretty solid. And, uh, uh, but there has been some mismanagement uh, for uh, a few reasons. Uh, one, the um, large member states have been at the same time too reluctant to accept real monitoring by Europe and too polite with each other. This means that uh, uh, France, Germany, Italy, have resisted many times the appeals by the European Commission before the crisis to, for example, give more powers to Eurostat to check the finances of individual countries or to um, have uh, the national governments submit, submit for a mutual check of consistency their national budgets to Europe before going to their parliaments. All these things which were then immediately accepted after the Greek crisis were strongly resisted before. Also, politeness. In the Council, um, it was the habit that uh, there were, particularly the large, but the countries in general, polite to each other, preferring to proceed to mutual uh, condonation of uh, deviations from good norm rather than having mutual uh, criticism uh, in the common interest of the well functioning of the whole. Of, uh, also, there, was, uh, uh, there were two other distortions in the, in the framework. Uh, one was uh, the excessive accent on the short term and the neglect of the long term. This, in particular, um, we have seen in the structure of the Stability and Growth Pact and in the way in which it was enforced in the, la in the first few years, uh, very little attention given to acts for the future of the European economy and of the national economies, uh, disregard for 
public investment, which may be bad and perverse investment, but may also be a very necessary investment for the development of infrastructures uh, that the private sector not always is able to do itself. And uh, the uh, last, uh, I would say, uh, not basic uh, mistake in the policy framework, but uh, uh, bias was the belief that uh, the source of all problems was the public was and would have been the public sector, whereas the private sector was in itself inherently innocent. Now the combination of these last two biases has brought, uh, for example, to the huge expansion of uh, private credit uh, um, for consumption of real estate in uh, uh, Spain, in Ireland, all that promenated from factors that were not monitored by the Stability and Growth Pact, but which nevertheless were devastating. Uh, I think when the crisis erupted, the progress shown in adapting the governance with new instruments and a new spirit has been more remarkable than it's usually, it's usually believed, both as regards growth, but more incisively as regards stability of the Eurozone. Uh, I spoke uh, here in, uh, on the 9th of May of 2012, uh, being at that time uh, Prime Minister of Italy, and uh, I was making a sort of a progress report of what was in the making at that time uh, to improve the governance of the Eurozone, the discussions uh, with President Hollande and others on the Growth Pact, which was then, which then saw the light in the uh, June European Council, but with greater difficulty, but also with greater results, also in the short term, the common work to give more stability to the Eurozone, which then materialized uh, in uh, a meeting uh, we organized in Rome with Chancellor Merkel, President Hollande and Prime Minister Rajoy, which was in preparation of the European Council of June 28-29-2012, where the adoption of a unanimous statement of the Eurozone leaders to the effect that there was a need for joint action to stabilize the government bond market, but only for those countries which were in line with the EU rules, was the necessary condition for the ECB and its president to do what they did, uh, what they said first, and then they did a few weeks uh, later. Uh, I will conclude by two negatives, on the other hand, uh, politically. And I believe that in the next stage of European life, uh, these should be taken much more into consideration. One was simply the impression that I got as a temporary participant to the European Council for a an year and a half, being much less politician than uh, all the other heads of states and governments, I was nevertheless greatly impressed by the lack of political discussion at that table. We looked uh, as if we were slightly senior finance minister. Uh, um, I proposed, uh, for example, that we should have, this was 2012, a serious discussion in an ad hoc session of the European Council on the reasons for the populism that was coming up in Europe and how we should adjust the substance of our policies but also our communication to cope with this before it uh, uh, grew up so much. President Van Rompuy was in agreement with this idea but then the crisis uh, and all the other urgencies. So there, there is badly, I believe, the need to be able for the European Union to have an instance at the highest level of blunt, candid political reflection, not always overwhelmed by the contingency of the crisis. And very last point, 
which, uh, which is the populism. We are now all afraid by populism. Uh, why don't we make a big, uh, a, a greater effort to, to show that populism is against the interest of people? Uh, it can be done. The Council on the Future of Europe uh, tried an exercise, which is being published these days. If you take one by one the contentions of the different populists, not one of them is entirely wrong. There is always a basis that deserves consideration, except that systematically the recipes provided would uh, bring to the worsening of the situation for the very citizens that they want to cater. And uh, it's interesting, this is really my last word, that uh, the manifestations are very different. For example, in the UK, in France, populism in their different uh, manifestations, populists there believe, in my view erroneously, but it is their belief, that national, pure national sovereignty could do better. And they believe, after all, that the use that was made by politicians when the sovereignty was more full than it is today was, after all, not a bad use in comparison with what they see now in Europe. In Italy, it's completely different. The largest, uh, more resounding, uh, more vibrant and more colorful of the populist parties in Italy is a party which puts as number one target the behavior of the politicians. It's called anti-politica, anti-casta. They are not old enough on average to realize that if they really were able to bring Italy out of the Euro as they would like, this would be a monumental gift made by them to the traditional politicians because they would again operate in a context that would be free of uh, uh, controls on state aid to, to uh, public sector participations which forced companies, uh, state companies to be more separated from political influences. Uh, in a nutshell, we would go back to a great facilitation of clientelism, corruption, uh, and uh, uh, abuse of the future generations. Just, just to follow up on kind of one dimension of, of the rise of populism and the concerns that, that are expressed in that regard, I mean, what would your view be, um, I guess quickly to both of you, you know, what is the role of globalization in this? Because I think, you know, in the context of thinking about the crisis, it's very much a focus on, you know, what has to be done inside Europe, fixing the holes in the Eurozone. But at the same time, there are a lot of dynamics that are happening in the world economy, which are really giving rise to a lot of the pressures um, that are reflected in the, in the, in the politics that we see uh, today, right? So just some, you know, quick statistics. If you look at growth rates over the last 30 years or so, uh, the countries in East Asia and the Pacific have grown by uh, 700 percent. So real income in those countries have gone up by 700 percent. So countries in the rest of the world are becoming much richer, but at the same time, on a per capita income basis, it's much lower, right? So the per capita income average in East Asia today is $3,000. In the European Union, it's 30,000. So there's still a lot of competitive pressure and that is giving rise, I think, to a lot of these concerns that we see in Europe today. So how, what would your perspective be in terms of how we deal with that kind of at the European level? So for example, we have the, the Globalization Adjustment Fund, which was put in place a while ago. Do you see that as one element of a response looking forward to kind of deal with some of the more structural issues that are, I think, underpinning a lot of the, the, the populist activity uh, in Europe. So. This works. Ah, this works, oh, thank you. <laughs> it, it, it's very un difficult to understand laterally, but uh, with this it works. Um, now, on globalization. Um, First of all, globalization is irreversible. 
there have been previous uh, waves of globalization, for example, just before the First World War, there has been, and it has been reversed by the World War, I think now it would be completely impossible, and one of the main reasons for that is uh, that uh, China is part of that globalization. So uh, now, now all big economies are part of the globalization, uh, and this is, is reflected in, in worldwide supply chains. Um, it's, it's reflected in, in a differing, in a, in a differentiated uh, uh, division of, of, of labor. Um, it, it's spurred by uh, very quick communication, um, low transport prices, and so on. So I don't really believe that. Uh, uh, you could uh, you could reverse it, so we have to live with it. Um, it has been doing a lot of uh, uh, a lot of very good things. Uh, with all the uh, the, uh, the criticism I could have about China about their respect of uh, human rights and so on, but one has to uh, recognize that uh, they managed to lift uh, hundreds of millions of people out of poverty uh, in in just in, in, in 30 years, so you cannot say that they have not uh, been effective. Um, but it is true that populism um, takes largely root in that uh, uh, tectonic change at the global level. People are afraid of that, don't understand it. it uh, it's putting pressure on um, the lower wages, I mean, the, the, the buying power of the lower wages is going down. That's a fact of life. And we, which means that also those that are situated uh, relatively higher fear that the same could happen to them as well. Now, my belief is that uh, the only way to confront the globalization is uh, to do it together as a European Union. That's the only way to approach it. That's what I try to do with uh, uh, a number of, of free trade agreements uh, so that we uh, can defend our role on, on, the, on the world economic stage. That's what we try to do with, uh, with TTIP so that also in the next uh, generation we would be in the lead when it comes to norms, standards, regulations, uh, disciplines, uh, disciplines which are very urgently needed uh, uh, globally, for example, with respect to subsidies. So the only way to confront that is, uh, is together. But you cannot avoid that while everything becomes bigger, that people um, want to live in a smaller environment, you know. Uh, not even the national state anymore. They, 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 are, they try to live in, in smaller communities. They think that they, their cities, for example, protect them better than their national states do. So that's a, uh, it's, it's a national reaction of entropy. Uh, in, the, in, in the human mind that, that uh, is, is very difficult to master. Now, can we do something about uh, uh, globalization? For example, the big question is, in this age of globalization, can Europe still grow? That's the basic question. Now, when you go back uh, a decade, let's say, then we got about 2% of, of growth on average. But we should realize that uh, this was also partly, at least partly, because we had a lot of bubbles. You know? Now, uh, I think for the foreseeable future, we are not very much interested in bubbles anymore. So we will have to find other ways. And are there other ways? Yes, there are other ways. Because Europe, generally speaking, is competitive. If Europe were not competitive, we would not have a trade surplus. And we have a trade surplus that is uh, rising every year. So that we must have some competitive edge somewhere, no? Um, but what is, of course, important is this transformation of the economy, and the only way to do that, I believe, is, is uh, uh, at least three vectors. First, we have to finalize the internal market, which is not yet completed. Uh, Professor Monti made a very interesting report on that at the demand of uh, President Barroso some years ago, in fact, in the beginning of, of, of the mandate of this commission, but we still have to do it with respect to uh, transport, with respect to telecom, uh, with uh, respect to energy, for example. So we have to create a bigger home market for our businesses. It's very important that we have a big home market 
um, and then, of course, a link, of course, with the financial crisis. Uh, the, the, the financial system isn't working properly. I mean, the banking system isn't working properly. So you, you could talk a lot about that. But so we have to complete the internal market. That seems to me the most important one. Secondly, we should develop more new products. Products being something that you can sell on the world market and that is innovative. Uh, and for that you re need research and development. And when you look very closely to research and development, you have seen there again that uh, member states have tried to renationalize even what they are doing together at the European level, you know, which means that the output went down. We should seriously address this. What are we going to do with our European research and development efforts? And uh, thirdly, we have to open markets for our companies. Uh, if we pursue all the free trade agreements that we are presently negotiating, then more than 75% of our trade will be in uh, that uh, new uh, context of uh, uh, free trade agreements. That, that's very, very important that we can open in this way markets for our companies. So yes, we have still a lot of possibilities on the world market. Um, and I believe that there are possibilities for all member states, you know. But this will mean that we have to do a common effort that will take some time. Do you want to follow up? Uh, yes, I would. Uh, on this trade issue, uh, being a journalist, I'm obviously very sensitive to uh, public opinion. And um, um, in this big era of skepticism, we can see that there is uh, kind of movement towards protectionism, you know, free trade. Free trade is very often perceived as a, as a negative thing. It has uh, it is perceived as has having had negative consequences on the middle class. Uh, there's the rise of inequalities. We, you know, the, the, the success of Thomas Piketty's book in uh, on both sides of the Atlantic is also a symptom of this. Uh, of this uh, rising sensitivity. And in that context, I would like to, to ask you both maybe, how do you deal with this issue first? And second, um, uh, why is it, why the negotiations for the TTIP, the free trade uh, transatlantic uh, agreement, are being conducted in secrecy? Isn't this uh, a, you know, a way of feeding all these fantasies and fears about free trade. Why isn't there more transparency about this? Wouldn't that help uh, to counter this populism and this negativism? First of all, we are not conducting those uh, negotiations in secrecy. Uh, that's what a, a number of uh, NGOs are claiming. They are claiming that because fundamentally they are against free trade, you know. Uh, and a lot of lies are also uh, told about, uh, for example, the negotiations with the United States. Uh, I have said that already a hundred times, I know several times in the European Parliament, for example, that uh, we are not going to import uh, hormone beef. I've said that very clearly. I cannot just say that before the European Parliament, you know, if, uh, if I were we're doing the opposite, it will be content of parliament. Huh? Yeah, uh, there, are, there have been ages that you, they put you in jail for that, you know. So uh, when I say there will be no import of hormone beef, then unless the country is proved there is no import of hormone beef. No, if, if not, there is no logic in the system anymore. The same with uh, uh, the GMOs. We have a legislation on GMOs in Europe. We have it. And as a result of that, uh, 53 GMOs have been authorized in the past and we authorized three or four more a couple of uh, months ago because we co were uh, condemned, uh, convicted in fact by the European Court of Justice because we took more than 10 years to take a decision. Um, now on the secrecy itself, uh, now maybe just one little phrase be be before I go to the secrecy itself. Uh, now why are some uh, politicians continue continuing to say that we are going to import hormone beef. Why are they doing that? For example, tonight you will have a debate in this room with Mr. Bovet. 
he will say we are going to import home on beef. He is simply saying that because it serves his political purposes. That's why he is doing it. Because he knows that he is lying. We have recently concluded an agreement with, with Canada where we had exactly the same problem and it's explicitly said in the treaty that it can be no hormone beef that is imported. And that will be the same with the United States, you know. So these are outright lies because they are against this agreement as such. Now on the secrecy, um, it's, it's a very interesting question because we have never been as transparent on a trade negotiation as this one. Our positions are known. I discuss this all the time with the European Parliament. Uh, after each round there is a, a, a conference with stakeholders. Uh, if you look at the website of the European Commission and you read everything on, on TTIP, it would spoil at least three summer holidays, you know. So everything is there, you know. Um, where we have a problem is that the United States do not want us to make public their documents because they have a completely different tradition. They speak uh, with their own members of parliament, by the way, on the basis of a reading room where they can consult the documents and read them and so on. We are used that they get the documents, that the, the council gets the documents, the member states get the documents, and also the European parliament gets the documents. But you should clearly distinguish, I believe, between um, transparency and confidentiality. You cannot negotiate if there is no confidentiality on a number of, of, of arguments, you know. Because everything you say is considered to be your final stance. Of course, that's not true in negotiations. Then you would be a very poor negotiator. So yes, there are a number of things that are confidential that we still have to develop. But uh, everything we propose and also the direction it takes is constantly discussed with the institutions. So there I think it is transparent. Now what a number of NGOs would like to do is that they sit to my right hand and left hand side and, and negotiate with us together. Now that's not the idea of course. That's, that's not transparency. Then you cannot negotiate anymore. But just as, as uh, President Monti said, uh, when he talked about uh, this uh, anti-European movement that it would result uh, in, in, let's say, the, uh, the difficulties of the past at the level of the national states, you know. The same would happen if uh, these people got right on, on international negotiations. You would get back to, to a, a, a European uh, context that uh, is autarkian. Now, there are no examples in human history where you can develop an economy without trade, you know. There are none. Ninety percent of the, of the growth is going to generate uh, as from 2020, outside Europe. How can we grow if we cannot tap into that growth? How, how could we do that? I mean, it, it's very s simple mathematics, and it's simply completely impossible to do that. But they don't want that, you know. They are against Europe, and people should understand that. It's not th that they don't believe that there will be no home on leave, you know. No, because if they believe that, then they, have not an they don't have an argument anymore. That's what it is about. And I'm very pleased, to, by the way, you are French, eh? but I'm very pleased that you have now a new minister for trade, uh, Mrs. Pellerin, uh, who says, look, uh, when Europe says there will be no hormone leave and they are not going to change the legislation on, on GMOs, we should believe them. That's what she had said in, in a press statement openly yesterday, you know. And also we should look at the merits of the ISDS before taking a decision. So let's look at the facts. And let's not do it on the basis of what we think could happen, you know. Can, <coughs> can I pick up uh, one point that you mentioned? The backlash against globalization coming out from the middle class and from the anxieties uh, about uh, uh, inequalities. I think this is a real major threat and uh, not unfounded because if we consider the effects of integration and globalization in terms of uh, uh, distribution of wealth and income among countries in the world, there has been a beneficial effect uh, with a redistribution in favor of the poorest, uh, of, or the poorer. But no doubt within countries, 
industrial countries in the first place, there has been a growing problem of inequalities. Uh, and this poses, in my view, the huge problem of how to govern globalization from the point of view of the key instrument for public powers to redistribute, which is tax. And uh, here I see one encouraging sign, because whereas in many areas the progress initially done by the G20 when the financial crisis uh, hit first, has then been gone back a bit and without the emergency of the ongoing crisis progress has been slower and there has been some backward movement but not in the area of the global fight against tax evasion and tax havens including the news of a few days ago i think this is a very important uh, uh, process and in Europe, this takes on, in my view, the additional dimension. We need, uh, as one uh, would say probably in France, uh, uh, to reconcilie le marché et le social. We do not want to create additional enemies to the single market and to integration because there are many people who believe that uh, integration globally or within the single market in Europe uh, deprives more and more the governments from the resources with which to perform some redistribution of income to help those who suffer from globalization, at least temporarily. This is why I believe that on the agenda of the new Commission and Parliament and Council, the topic of how to keep the single market flowing and actually improving it also, also by uh, allowing member states to have the resources for some social policy will be key. And probably the answer is some tax coordination, a bit more than before, because it's, of course it's a very critical uh, area because if there is too much tax coordination and if the member states, uh, supposing they were, they were able to become a cartel of taxers against uh, those taxed, Europe's competitiveness would, uh, would suffer. But on the other hand, if uh, there is unlimited tax competition among European countries, then this uh, turns against European integration be to, because it will uh, reduce and reduce and reduce the persons and the governments in favor of having of going ahead with the single market. I believe that France is not the country where this is felt uh, the least. Taxes is a, a difficult question at times of fragile recovery, but I think I have an even more difficult and pressing one. Unemployment. I think unemployment is a time bob for the European integration process and particularly youth unemployment. We know that in most European countries youth unemployment is double or triple the average unemployment. So I would like to hear you, Professor Montin, Commissioner de Gouk, what is your proposal? How can we create jobs? My own poor knowledge in economics says at times of fiscal consolidation uh, the margin for public investment is small. On the other hand, one wonders, should we expect job creation only from the private sector and in what way? Is this something that we can learn from countries outside the European Union? My answer, my answer uh, would, be, would be the following. In time of fiscal consolidation, it's uh, more difficult to create jobs. At the same time, let us not forget that if there is such a high youth unemployment in Europe, particularly in south of Europe, in my view, this is because the European framework came in too late, not because there is today a European framework, because uh, the, the young unemployed in this country, for one, or oh, their very bad
condition to the fact that the political life in pre-single market and pre-single currency Europe was leaving the politicians of, 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 of those days free to satisfy all requests of, so of society without a corresponding uh, tax revenue and of course it was the deficit, it was the debt which uh, was generated then and the future generations of, of that time are now those who cannot find a job. So I think it's crucial to explain that it, it is the delayed effect of a lack of some European induced discipline rather than being the current effect of European current fiscal discipline. Nevertheless, I believe very firmly, I believe so since many years, since the days in which the original stability pact was created, that it would be good economic common sense to uh, allow more room for public sector investment, maybe very narrowly and strictly defined in an harmonized way, etc., etc. That is critical. Uh, for the rest, uh, I think uh, the classical uh, uh, rules uh, still apply. Uh, in order to reduce youth unemployment, I believe if we take one country, say this country, we need to gain competitiveness so that uh, our products uh, can be uh, more easily uh, sold elsewhere and uh, foreign products uh, uh, become slightly less competitive uh, domestically. Uh, so the competitiveness aspect, which is also not only but also a problem of labor market efficiency and uh, the labor market efficiency depends on how within the labor market the power of unions and of other entities over protect those who have a job making life even more difficult to the excluded including those who would like to be included for the first time and the gentleman who hosted us uh, here on uh, the previous occasions, uh, as you may know, now works in another building in another city and from the Prime Minister's uh, building in Rome, uh, Prime Minister Renzi is precisely trying to have that reform of the labour market which uh, his party under a previous leadership uh, uh, opposed. And then there will be, but in my view only at the end, some specific ad hoc measures for the youth. But by and large, a more adequate macro policy framework with a more favorable view to public investments, a more efficient labor market with the addition of some youth guarantees, etc., hopefully will ta with time will, will help. Commissioner De Gucht, do you want to quickly <coughs> come in on this question in terms of what the trade agreement context might do before we go back to the floor and ask for some questions? <coughs> yes, I, I largely agree with uh, President Monti uh, that it's about uh, structural reforms in the European economy. Now, let me just say a word on this uh, um, antinomy, quote unquote, between uh, uh, fiscal consolidation and, and growth. Um, when you look at the fiscal consolidation, it has, been, has merely been done by uh, levying higher taxes. And overall, um, from a structural point of view of, of, of the uh, uh, national budgets, uh, much uh, less has been done. Uh, President Monti uh, uh, take very brave steps with respect to uh, uh, to pensions, for example, and uh, well, uh, he could probably explain uh, what was the result of that. It, the result is very good for the future, but uh, uh, the immediate result uh, uh, was, of course, also political. So it's very, very difficult to have structural changes in the behavior of uh, whatever political structure, by the way, not only national 
also at the, at the level of the European Union it is the case. Uh, so I believe that uh, with respect to the national budgets we should continue to have um, um, structural adjustments. And what I fear is that now everybody says, okay, now we should stop about this uh, austerity and fiscal consolidation and putting order in the budget. We have to foster growth, so we have to spend more. But that's not the solution. The solution is that we continue to spend a lot of money at all levels and also at the level of the national uh, member states in a very inefficient way. We should manage to spend money much more efficient. Um, so there is no opposition between, let's say, having a more efficient budget on the one hand, which probably will result in, in, in some expenses going down and others uh, uh, getting up, and on the other hand, uh, do the necessity that you get more growth. That's what they try to sell us, that it is an antinomy between those two. That's not true. Uh, and why are a lot of people claiming that there is this antinomy? Well, because they would like to have, again, the same laxist budgetary policies in member states as we had known them in the past, and where now the young generations are paying the price for, you know. That, that, that's the real danger. Not, I think everybody should be in, in favor of, of, of growth. We need more jobs, we need more growth, we, we need to, to, to give uh, um, a prospect for a new generation, but we should not do it, again, based on laxist national policies. Great, thanks a lot. So I'd like to open it up now to questions from the floor, comments. I've been told there are microphones on both sides. Um, we have a lot of lights in our eyes, so we can't really see. So if you could just stand up and wave, then I can give you the floor there. So in the back, white shirt. Thank you very much uh, for these very interesting comments. Um, my name is Lukas Hakelberg. I'm a PhD student uh, here at the EUI, and I work on the issue of international tax cooperation that was raised by Professor uh, Monti. And what I would like to know from Professor Monti is um, um, we indeed see a level of tax cooperation that uh, was unimaginable only a short while ago, and which is, I guess, mostly due uh, to pressure exerted by the United States. So what I would like to know is what you think is in it for the United States. Why are they pushing for this so much right now, and why haven't they done this before? Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, recently it's very much pressure from the United States, and that has been uh, uh, motivated and underpinned by concerns uh, about uh, tax evasion uh, out of a country which uh, takes uh, tax evasion very, very seriously, like the U.S., and also, as you know better than I do, out of the concerns about uh, the link between tax evasion, money laundering, financing of terrorism. But um, if we take a slightly longer retrospective view, I would not underestimate the contribution that the European Union uh, provided to this uh, movement. In particular, uh, in the late 90s, uh, the, when the OECD uh, adopted a, a, a code of conduct <coughs> on corporate taxation and uh, uh, on other principles of joint action uh, to, uh, against tax evasion, uh, that was very largely the result of the previous internal action uh, within the EU, which had brought uh, in particular to the introduction of the very first uh, uh, directive on savings taxation. Then there were the problems of those countries which did not uh, want to uh, proceed to the exchange of information, etc. But on the whole, so I see this as a fairly good example of uh, European within itself action of transatlantic cooperation, uh, largely driven by the OECD as the technical uh, instance. And, and this is a reason for, for, for encouragement, because I mean, this is really a very, very sensitive area where the uh, power of the interests opposing any progress in terms of private interests and the interests of some countries 
was monumental. So I think this is a good uh, ray of hope uh, as regards the possibility to have international governance even in the most uh, difficult areas. There was a question there in the middle, I think. A lady? Yes. Only of jobs for the young people, but housing, and not housing as we see it in Melbourne or in America, dependent on cars, but garden cities like Isolotto uh, of Giorgio Lapira and uh, George, uh, Giovanni Michel Michelucci, um, where people can uh, move about with bicycles and a tram, where they can have garden allotments where they can be craftspeople, as well as interrelating with the globalization. Um, this would give, I think, our young people a sense of hope, a place where they could have families, where the children could play, with access to land. And I think it could be achieved through a high taxation where there are abandoned factories and then lowering it where these could be changed into garden cities next to a larger city in Europe. This would solve problems, for instance, of the, the Roma in Romania who desperately need housing, and also our young people here, also in England. Hmm. Who wants to take that? Uh, I personally think this was uh, more and less than a question. It is, uh, it is less than a question in the sense that it does not require an answer, certainly on my side. I, I don't know enough about this crucial topic, and it is much more than a question because you provided us with uh, factual elements and a track for reflection on how to solve an extremely severe and critical problem. So thank you. Uh, question there, yes, gentleman with his hand up. Thank you very much. Thanks for the uh, presentations. Anthony Gooch from the OECD. I'd like to thank uh, Mario Monti for uh, recognizing the work of the organization and confirm that it was actually the Franco German axis that really provided the political impetus for the work on uh, tax through the G20. It was Peer, Steinbrook, and uh, Eric Wirt uh, at the time. Two questions for me, and I appreciated the frankness of Carol de Gucht when he was talking about uh, hormone-treated beef. Firstly, on the banks. In the US, a number of decisions were taken at a certain time. They were all very politically sensitive, a lot of debate in Congress around TARP. What do you think of the initial uh, lack of action that was taken in uh, the European context? And I'd say in particular, having praised France and Germany in France and Germany around uh, uh, their uh, banks. And secondly, what do you think of the degree of honesty or lack of honesty when you look at specific cases? Spain. What is the responsibility in Spain when one looks at the crisis? Who lent money for the property boom? Who sold the houses? Who sold the property? and who bought the property. As I would say, it's an eminently European problem. Thank you. My equipment is a little bit uh, <laughs> complex. <coughs> um, first of all, on the banks, it, it's obvious that one of the reasons uh, that uh, the United States uh, managed to uh, overcome um, earlier on the, uh, the downturn as a result of the crisis is because uh, it took them less time to put order in their banks. That's uh, one of the reasons. They are claiming that and I think to a certain extent that's also true. Um, we lacked this uh, powers, let's say, within the uh, ECB uh, to have that kind of robust intervention uh, with the banks. And uh, we got uh, through several uh, stress tests 
and probably now the, the, the serious one will be uh, once the ECB has really looked at all the banks and, and uh, uh, identified the problems that still have to be fixed. I mean, you see it also in, in the whole banking sector that this is not uh, uh, the final picture that we will have once the crisis is over. You will see a, a number of changes and I think it's very important to, that we fix it uh, as soon as possible. That, as uh, President Barroso said, we managed to have this banking union with the supervisory role of the ECB, uh, with also uh, the uh, resolution uh, mechanism and, and the, uh, the, the funds that we bring together for whenever we would uh, again have uh, to be, have to confront that kind of problem. So yes, it took us more time and you need a properly working banking system in the European Union if not, that is going to devastate the internal market. Uh, what you see it now, and that's a very, a very bad evolution in fact, is that um, banks are again, again operating much more locally within their member states. Um, they have become smaller, but apart from that they are, have also become very risk averse to do anything else in an environment that they do not completely know. So that cannot work. Uh, the European Central Bank is playing a pivotal role for, for the day money of the banks. Normally, uh, in, in, in a properly functioning financial system, it should be between the banks. But it doesn't happen now between the banks because they don't trust each other. So it's not properly functioning. So we really have to make a number of additional steps. Um, and hopefully that uh, will happen as a result of this uh, stress test that uh, presently is being performed by the uh, European uh, Central Bank, but it will take time to reinstall that confidence. It, it it's, uh, takes much less time to uh, lose confidence than to rebuild it. And that will take time and, for example, as, you, as President Monti has been saying repeatedly in the past, uh, one of the problems of the uh, Italian economy are the banks and the way uh, they are in a position uh, to give uh, credit uh, to uh, economic initiatives. I mean, it's going better now, but uh, with a very high rates of interest, uh, nobody could take an, an economic initiative or an industrial initiative in, 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 in Italy anymore. I mean, so that's, these, these are really uh, very uh, uh, serious problems. Now, with respect to Spain, that's, it's, it's an, uh, uh, very clearly, it, it was a real estate bubble that was built there, who gave the, the credits the banks, who uh, was buying all well, the people who wanted to buy a house, and uh, there obviously was a mismatch, uh, and that resulted in the bubble you had. So everybody there has a responsibility, uh, but uh, it's obvious that if the uh, national supervisory institutions of the banks had worked together, this would not have happened. I don't know precisely the situation in Spain. I know precisely the situation in the country I know best. And for example, the whole uh, debacle with respect to Dexia is a result of the fact that uh, the, uh, Europe, the, the, the Belgian and the French supervisory institutions did not work together because they were jealous of each other. And together they got in, 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 into the hole, you know. And uh, now it, it's costing a lot of money to get out of there uh, again. So that, that's why it's very, very good, I believe, that we now have this supervisory approach at the European level. Uh, because it, it will make that the, nation, that the national supervisory institutions will not be, or at least will be much less in a position to protect their so-called national champions. You know, that's what we have been doing in the past. So yes, uh, the banking union probably is not perfect. Nothing is perfect that we do. Uh, but it's a big step forward to avoid that kind of bubbles. It's not true that they couldn't have avoided the bubble. Uh, you see now that, that uh, when, when the, the, the lending goes in the, the wrong direction, that supervisory institutions take measures, and they can take measures vis-à-vis -vis banks, but they haven't done so. So there is a lot of responsibility with them, and the only way to, to remedy that is to have it at the European level, of course in close cooperation with the national supervisory institutions, just as you do it also in competition, by the way. But it has to be European. If not, uh, 
you have the tendency to protect your champions and even if you see that there are problems you say look maybe we shouldn't say too much about that because it could weaken our institutions and so on and so on so that's what we have to get rid of I can uh, easily save a bit of time because I entirely subscribe to what Commissioner de Gucht said excellent so let's take another question then yes there in the back Thank you. My name is Roberto Castaldi. I'm a researcher at the Sant'Anna School in Pisa. After Maastricht, there was a vast academic and political consensus that the monetary union could not work without an economic and political union as well. We still have a single market, a single currency, and 18 if you look at the Eurozone, or 28 if you look at the EU economic and fiscal policy. Do you believe that is the task of the next European legislature to try and set up a European government of the economy? Uh, I save the time for this uh, easy question, maybe. Uh, no, I believe that you have been slightly optimistic in your account of the deficiencies of the uh, monetary uh, union in Europe because it's not true that we have a, a really oper operating single market as Commissioner de Gucht underlined. We still have to do a lot in that area and uh, uh, I would like also to note that uh, many of the countries within the Eurozone apply the single market rules uh, uh, less diligently than most of the countries outside the Eurozone. So the much talked about uh, uh, UK, the Nordic countries uh, uh, not belonging to the Eurozone, uh, many of the new uh, member states of Central Europe uh, have created more of a single market actually in place than the large continental economies uh, which uh, believe they are, and probably they are indeed, the center of the Eurozone. So we have there a slightly schizophrenic uh, way of existing of this uh, far suboptimal uh, monetary area in Europe, because uh, if we consider economic and monetary union, it is as if some member states have specialized more in the monetary and have neglected the, so they have done a good job on the M, the monetary, but a rather poor job on the E, the economic. Um, and, and, and my dream about uh, the way to solve uh, the British uh, possible future referendum in relation to changes in European policies or treaties is uh, simply that we all uh, acquire uh, the peace of our senses by having the UK take a bold and successful move uh, to um, have continental Europe play more seriously the uh, rules of the single market, of competition, uh, of, of openness, and then uh, shut up uh, for, their, for a number of years about uh, the other forms of their rather insular modality of looking at Europe. And, and of course, you are entirely right, we need to make progress, uh, but uh, let's not underestimate the degree to which uh, uh, the 18 or 28 uh, different uh, uh, budgetary policies, for example, have been in fact converging. You just ask national members of parliament, pa members of national parliaments, how they feel about the, the, the fact that uh, their governments send uh, the budget draft first to Brussels, then to them. So that is in the making. Thank you. Please go ahead. Yeah, let, let me briefly add this. Um, there is this uh, uh, budgetary uh, censorship, let's say, at the European level. What you will see is when, is when the economy starts growing again that uh, uh, national parliaments will criticize it more and more, you know. 
and we will need a lot of uh, courage, I believe, in the next uh, college and also in, in, in Council of Ministers to, to keep to our promises and, and what we said in, in, uh, in their times. So already that will come under pressure, you can be sure of that. Now the whole idea of having one fiscal policy, uh, one macroeconomic policy, uh, I don't believe that. Uh, maybe ideally that should happen, but it won't, because you have um, un the European Union, it's 28 democracies, you know, that have elections, and elections are about changing policies, about changing uh, approaches in, in, in fiscal policy, for example. Uh, so you cannot, on the, on the one hand, harmonize completely at the European level and nevertheless demonstrate at the national level that democracy uh, still has its rights, you know. So there is, this is this big danger that, this, this we are, that we are organizing this kind of clash. So if we were to limit ourselves to the, uh, uh, to, to the criteria with respect to the budgets, um, then automatically you have convergence also macroeconomically. You cannot avoid that. But we should not uh, try to, uh, uh, to get, uh, to grind too high, you know, because then we could fall, uh, we could fall very low. Uh, you can do a number of things also on fiscal policy. For example, you could do quite a lot on, on, on the, uh, uh, the fiscality of, of, of enterprises, not only on the tariffs, but also and certainly on, on the uh, taxable basis, for example. So yes, there you can do a number of things. But the kind of idea that uh, in the beginning of the year you get guidelines and all the member states are going to follow this and automatically they will adapt, uh, uh, agree that, uh, that they have one uh, common economic policy, macroeconomic policy. I don't believe that, that that's not workable. And uh, we should try not to put into motion too many things that cannot work, you know. So let's try to keep uh, to the disciplines that we have installed, of course, with you uh, taking into um, a consideration that the changing uh, economic landscape and the changing, um, uh, how would I say, the, the changing uh, uh, time where you are in an economic cycle, of course. So macroeconomics always come in by the back door, but having the idea that we can only have a monetary union if we completely harmonize also economic policy First, I don't believe it's right, and secondly, we will never manage to do that. Okay, we're, we're running out of time. We need to stop in a few more minutes. I'm going to give the last word to Sylvie with a quick question, if you could answer that quickly as well. We have about four minutes left, and then we have to close. Okay, so I, I'll, I'll choose a very easy question. Uh, <laughs> um, Professor Monti was talking earlier about the lack of long-term political or long-term strategic also thinking, I guess, in, in the European Union. There's one area where we have uh, uh, been rather short-sighted, apparently. It's the digital uh, market area. There is a digital divide, not only within our societies, but a transatlantic, very deep digital divide. Uh, we are a huge market for data and um, uh, electronic uh, um, products and, and internet uh, uh, con uh, con consumption, but uh, the big companies are all American. We are totally absent of this of this market as as, as big groups and uh, European uh, force. What can we do about this? Uh, should we have? A, I mean, what 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 are your solutions? How do you see this issue? How do you identify it and? What could be the, the remedies? In one, in one minute. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I cannot give an answer to your question in, in four minutes, I mean, but let me try to give a couple of elements. What the, the reason it has developed in the United States and not with us is because we lacked the big home market. Uh, the, the digital market, I mean, what should be the digital market, it's, uh, it's cut into 28 pieces. You know? I hope that as a result of the new proposal by Nelly Cruz that you seek some consolidation also in the, uh, in the European market. Um, secondly, we see uh, a couple of national monopolies um, 
arising in that sector. And, and for example, for searching uh, machine Janssen, which is a, is a very serious uh, problem politically also, because uh, what's then the relationship between, let's say, the, the, the transport mechanisms the, 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 uh, that have been created, uh, transport of data that have been created uh, by the digital area and the content. To what extent can the, 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 the uh, uh, can the structure, the infrastructure, uh, dominate the, the superstructure, which is the content? That's a very serious problem we have to address in Europe. And thirdly, I cannot speak with the United States about anything that has to see with uh, uh, audiovisual or culture or whatever. I cannot do that. Huh? Mainly, by one of the reasons being uh, uh, your country. Huh, by the way. Uh, now, we should do it, but not about subsidies to, to movie makers and, and all that kind of things, but precisely about this, you know. This is something that we should discuss with the United States, to what extent we can accept uh, the development, the further development of this kind of national monopolies in that sector. We should discuss it, and we should address this with a much more open mind than we are presently doing. So that should be included in the TTIP? Negotiations. But it should be part of the TTIP negotiations. Then. It presently isn't because we don't have a mandate to do so. But what I'm trying to say is that uh, the, the cultural exception and everything that has to do with it, um, all very fine, you know, but the, these discussions and, and the future is not about whether or not we can give subsidies to our, uh, to our movie directors, you know. It's about what will be our place in the digital area because that's also where the cultural aspect will become predominant. For example, on content, I mean, that we should discuss it, yes. For example, you could ask yourself, is it normal that all these big companies have uh, at least half of their activities in Europe and there is no fiscal contribution whatsoever to Europe? Is that normal, you know? Uh, President Monti has been commissioner for, for, for competition, no? Uh, you have uh, done this uh, famous Microsoft case, well, again, you have this kind of discussions on Google and others. So we can uh, make a number of interventions, which we should also have a political approach. And we should, yes, we should, uh, they're discussing it and putting forward very clearly what we think should happen in that sector. Unfor unfortunately, we're out of time. If I, I, Do we need to stop right now? We can keep on going. Okay, so President Monty, if you want to then chip in on this topic, please. On Did this one? Yeah. React, okay. I think uh, nothing really to add, except that perhaps concerning the digital within the European Union, um, I see this uh, as one case in which uh, we need to have a final uh, strengthening of the instruments to put the single market in place and to have it observed by everybody. This is just the, the, the most recent, technologically speaking, uh, case. But uh, I don't want to finish uh, on a legal and technical note, but as long as any violation of the single market rules by a state or by a company um, takes uh, to be corrected by the Commission, to be removed uh, for five years, we cannot re really be very, very serious about an integrated uh, Europe. Uh, I mean, the paradox is that uh, it all goes back to the fall in the Berlin Wall. That moment, uh, the main objective of European integration changed as was natural. It was uh, enlargement and uh, the single currency, two historical objectives, both achieved. But as regards the single currency, this gave all of a sudden priority to aspects that uh, in an integrated union are less, are important, but less fundamental than aspects that were left behind to be concrete, because we have had uh, the Maastricht Treaty, the Stability Pact, the Six Pact, the Two Pact, um, the Fiscal Compact, etc., the apparatus 
to enforce the rules that exist concerning budgetary discipline is ten times stronger and uh, two or three times faster than the apparatus that exists for the enforcement of rules that are less uh, sexy, fashionable, but even more fundamental for a union that were decided already in the Treaty of Rome of 1957. The rules for uh, the single market, so many rules are there, but the instruments with which the Commission can tackle the violations of, the, of these rules are very obsolete. I was in charge of both responsibilities, single market and competition. In competition, the, the decision of the Commission goes immediately into effect, is able to remove the violation, and then, if anything, the guy, person or company or member state uh, that uh, uh, that uh, was hit by the decision of the Commission can appeal to the court. So I think we need to have uh, in a uh, single market the same degree of seriousness that we have in competition and even in uh, uh, budgetary policy enforcement. Otherwise we speak and speak and speak about uh, the single market, but it is it will be the topic for uh, 10, 12, uh, 20 future excellent reports. Thank you. I understand we still have some time. We were supposed to stop at 12, but I gather we can keep on going. So if there's another question from the floor, please. Yes. Um, there is a lot going on now about um, the creation of a financial transaction tax. Uh, do you think that it could be possible to invest the resources coming from that and from other uh, financial instruments at the European level, um, politically speaking, launching a European New Deal? A European? A Euro European? New Deal. New deal. Ah. Uh, you was both of us. At any rate, um, you, you are touching on uh, a special case of a much more general issue, which I think will be one of the issues dominating the discussion in Europe in the next uh, several years, the financing of the European Union. Uh, we uh, see the current way in which the uh, budget, not a very large budget, but at any rate, the budget of the European Union is financed. That is essentially through state contributions. And uh, it provides our citizens with a spectacularly repellent uh, um, scene every seven years. It's, l it's a luck that it is only once every seven years when the budget is negotiated. Uh, so there is uh, a, a lot going on in terms of reflections on whether the European Union should not have also own resources as initially it was uh, supposed to have. And I speak with uh, great uh, hesitation of any possible solution uh, to this issue because I've been asked by the three European institutions to chair a high-level group um, which I have started to work with uh, in the last few months uh, on own resources. So uh, we have some of the best minds from the Parliament, the Commission uh, and uh, also personalities designated by the uh, Council, the Member States. Uh, this is a two-year mandate. We will come up uh, uh, with proposals to submit to the institutions and uh, when uh, we will have very difficult negotiations I uh, will remember your uh, candid voice uh, in the Sala dei Cinquecento um, as a uh, sort of encouragement. Great, thank you. So I've just been told we have about eight minutes left so if there are other questions, comments, Please. 
Microphones behind you. Um, research has a fundamental role in the uh, European economy. At uh, the same time, I think that research is a, a role model, a positive role model in Europe. So what about a more strong, a better and more efficient European research policy? Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, madam. Um, of course, you need research at, uh, at, at both levels, at the national level and at the European level. Obviously so, and we have to spend more on research. Now, what you see is that uh, what one could call the productivity of research is too low. So, uh, the research results, how do you translate them into actual products uh, that can be marketed. That's one of the weaknesses uh, of our approach, uh, our European approach, and uh, there we should do something about the productivity of our research. But apart from that, um, the effort that is done at the European level should be a European effort. That's very important. And uh, what I see happening is that uh, also, let's say, about this European research that is funded by the European budget, Every member state tries to get as much of it and to get as much of it into their own research institutes. And that's a mistake. We should respect and the member states should respect that this is a different level that uh, is really um, taking profit of the fact that you are confronting all these uh, different approaches at the European level and focusing on a, a number of, of, of key issues like, for example, the CATS, the key uh, uh, enabling uh, uh, technologies of the future and there we should have a common effort on which and afterwards of course uh, member states can continue to build but you, but you have seen this um, trend of renationalization of research and development and we have tried to counter this under the, the last college and we should redouble those efforts uh, the only reason to have European research and development efforts is that it should not be national. It should not be national, because then you could as well do it at the national level, you know. Then it's a redistribution of money, and it should be a redistribution and a common effort of, uh, uh, of our brains, you know, that we put together our best brains so that they can come with uh, innovative solutions for the future. So please, member states, get your hands off European research. I mean, uh, a third experience, for example. This demonstrates that we can uh, uh, focus to a, um, a, a European efficient model of R&D. Well, I'm, I'm very much convinced of that, and by the way, uh, our research is, is, uh, is top level. But what I'm saying is that if you do it, if you have a common European effort, then it should really be a common European effort, and you should not try to renationalize re that, because then you could as well do it at the national level. That, that's the, what m m member states should keep in mind when they address this problem. Great, thanks. So I think last questions, I'll just go down the, the, the row here. So Anna, why don't you? Thank you. We've discussed about banks and what they do and they don't do. And we've discussed about the need to create growth and jobs. What do you think about mobilizing small, really tiny private investors in what has been fashionably called crowdfunding to help young people with bright ideas to create startup companies and to create employment? What is your view? Is this a good model to emulate? From what I know, this is kind of increasing like it has doubled between 2012 and 2013 in the U.S. Could this be an idea for the single market? I believe that crowdfunding in itself is a very good idea. Uh, that uh, the risk is in fact uh, divided over hundreds and even thousands of people uh, and uh, each of them have a, a small contribution in itself. It's a very good idea. Uh, by the way, you can become President of the United States with that model, and that's what uh, 
Obama largely did. Huh? He was inventing uh, crowdfunding at the political level. So yes, it makes a lot of sense uh, to do that. Um, and, and, uh, uh, but on the other hand, what you should realize, I think, is it's very good to, to, to start a number of initiatives, but then you need follow-up investments. Uh, and there venture capital comes into place. And how much venture capital is uh, um, available uh, in, in, in the uh, uh, different stages of a development of a company. And you also see that compared to 20 years ago, you need more money to build a company. So to start a company, crowdfunding, very good idea. But then the rest has to follow. And we have a lack of venture capital in Europe. And the main reason we have a lack of venture capital is because we are risk averse, you know. We are much more risk averse than, for example, in the United States of America. I mean, that's cultural, and cultural things, you don't fix them from the day to tomorrow. Okay, so one last question from my side, and then, then we'll close, I guess, to both of you. If there was, what is the one thing, to your mind, would be the most important hole in the single market? So if you had your druthers, what would you focus on in terms of kind of completing the internal market? I understood the internal market, but there was something before it. Could you, I'm and sorry, could you repeat? No, just in terms of, if you look back on your report, your 2010 report on, on deepening, yes. completing the single market, what would be the one thing that you would emphasize as really the priority to focus uh -huh. on that would make the biggest difference? Yeah. Uh, much, much of the specific recommendations has been taken up at the initiative of Commissioner Barnier in the Single Market Act 1 and Single Market Act 2. Uh, in my view, however, the two most difficult but most important uh, uh, proposals have not been uh, considered yet. And uh, one is precisely the one I mentioned in response to the, G to the G digital um, market, namely uh, how to reinforce the powers for the actual enforcement of the rules against violations of the rules. This is of paramount importance. And the other one, uh, in inherently political, is this uh, reconciliation between market and social that I referred to uh, in order to gain back some sympathy and at any rate some support for the single market by uh, uh, removing at least uh, the main shortfalls of the policy apparatus that uh, prevent member states to exercise a redistributive policy. Hence, again, the topic of tax coordination. I guess fr from I your perspective... I agree with uh, President Monti, but so let me give another example. I think politically it's very urgent that we complete, uh, well, complete, we, we, we make the internal market for energy by, uh, for example, interconnecting the grids, uh, by making that uh, Russia, for example, cannot apply differentiated prices anymore from uh, one national market to another. Uh, and that's a necessary step if we want to... Uh, become less dependent uh, for our energy resources. So, and by the way, I believe that's what is also going to happen in the next five years. This is really now a topic whose time has come, establishing an internal market uh, for energy, and probably we will even need to, to have some slight uh, changes in the treaty to do that, but this is really of the uh, uh, essence at this moment in time, politically, um, apart from the structural elements that uh, President Monti mentioned. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'd like to thank our panelists. Let's give them a hand and off to the next session. <laughs>